It is delicious. Fun to make. Folks, this is a recipe worth your time. I'm getting ready to do my filming and I step out for just a moment for a little bit of fresh air. My neighbor from downstairs comes out. She looks up and she says, are you out here to get pictures? Well, I looked at her and said, pictures of what? She said, the blue angels, they're gonna fly over. Well, okay, interesting. I said, when? She said, now, and I was like, oh, really? So I ran in here as fast as I could. I grabbed that camera right there and put, here, let me grab him. I put my 600 on there, okay? This is a good lens for that kind of stuff. All right, went back outside as quick as I could, switched my settings over, and here they come roaring over, and I started snapping shots. Folks, that was really fun. It was a really cool way to start doing a recipe. So, feeling energized and good, I came in here and finished the recipe I was designing. And this is, a, you know, as you know, I do recipe development and sometimes I do it right on the camera in front of you. Today is one of those days. I'm building a wonderful casserole and this is going to be Texas chicken casserole. I guarantee you it's gonna be good. The ingredients are perfect. They all are matched well. There's the right amount of each one. And when it's all put together, this is going to be incredible. So let me invite you into my kitchen. Let's take a look at all the ingredients and we'll get busy making Texas chicken casserole. <laughs> this is worth your time. Come on, let's go. Folks, the ingredients I have out for this fantastic casserole, well, it's a chicken casserole. That's the chicken we cooked up, shredded it, got it there, and some of the juice for it right there. All right, so we got the chicken part done. I got some heavy cream. I got Parmesan cheese, tomatoes, garlic, onion, jalapeno, poblano chilies, and some flour, butter, cheddar cheese. And back here, we got corn tortillas, paprika, sage, black pepper, and some salt. And folks, this is gonna be put together in such a way that nothing but good could come from it. Let's take a look at the next step. Well, I guess if we're going to have a Texas chicken casserole, we need a chicken for our casserole. And the way I'm gonna cook this one up, it's gonna be really simple. This is gonna be a stove top cook up. All I'm gonna do is take my chicken, as you see here, put it in the pot, put some water over the top of it, put a flame underneath it, Ladies and gentlemen, when this comes to a boil, I'm gonna reduce the temperature to a, um, a low temperature, and I am going to then cover it and let it just cook until the chicken literally falls apart. Now, at this stage, I don't have to season it. I don't have to do anything. Just get it cooked. Once the chicken's cooked, there's two things I wanna need. I wanna need the chicken, and I wanna need the, the stock the liquid that's left in the pot behind the cooking. All right, so that could both becomes part of this dish. If you would get your chicken all cooked up, and uh, now, so you'll know, I'm gonna put a little more water in here. I wanna bring the water up just so the breast is kind of sticking up a little bit above the water. Uh, and don't worry about anything drying out because we're gonna shred it. We're gonna add a little liquid back into the meat. It's gonna work out fine. This has been simmering for about an hour now. I'm gonna check. Okay, you see when I go tugging on that leg, that bone should just kind of pull right on out of there um, when it's as done as I want it to be. All right, so this just needs to cook some more. Look at that skin, it looks beautiful. It's just kind of puffed up and rendering through. This is all gonna be good stuff when it's done. And remember, we're not looking to keep it pristine. We're gonna shred it. All right, let's check our chicken here. Oh, looky there. That's what I'm talking about. Falling apart. 
quite literally. When the bird will kind of come apart like that, that is when it's pretty much where you need it to be, okay? This was an hour and a half in the cooking, not too bad for a medium chicken. Uh, and I'm just gonna pull all of it out, put it in that bowl, and let it cool down. Need to get everything cut up, so I'm gonna give a quick cutting, chopping, dicing lesson before we move on when handling a knife that has a wide blade like this, even though you've heard me say it in other videos, I'm gonna say it again. Fingers around the handle, of course, and then with the first finger and the thumb, you're gonna pinch the blade right there. So just like that is the way you hold a knife, and that gives you a safe control of that knife because the blade will not turn in your hand because of the way you're holding it. If you're holding it like this and you're pushing hard enough, that blade can suddenly turn, and then if your other hand is nearby and this is in motion, it can be problematic, okay? So you don't want that happening, and if you're holding it like this, that stops that. Onions leak more from the root end than they do from the top. So let's remove that top. And I'm gonna remove at least one outer layer and depending on the, how they look, maybe the second one. All right, once I get that done, we're gonna cut this down into dice. That'll be next. Something I would like to mention before I go cutting things up, sometimes I'll glove up. And most of the time when that happens, I'm dealing with something that might cause me an issue. Okay, and in this case, it's these guys right here. The oil inside of them is hot, okay? You know that because if you've ever eaten a jalapeno, especially a pickled one, you bite into it and it's hot, okay? Plain and simple. Now, when handling one of these, that oil can get on your skin. Okay, so you go and wash real good. You scrub thoroughly. You use detergent. You make sure your hands are spotless. And then you scratch in a sensitive location three or four hours later. Suddenly, that's burning. Well, guess what? <laughs> this stuff's easier to, or harder to remove than you might suspect. And it's a lot easier to get tricked by it than you might suspect. This little guy is easy to remove the heat from it because most of the heat is in the core and that is that white part in the middle that holds all the seeds. All right, so that's 90% of the heat. If you eat one pickled, the whole thing is hot because in the pickling process, that oil gets washed into the green meat, making the whole thing hot. When they're fresh, they're not like that. Onions, once you've got the outer layer removed, go ahead and split that onion lengthwise. Now, I'm gonna show you a neat method for dicing this up. But before I do that, I wanna mention when you set your knife down, if it's, the edge is pointed away from you and you accidentally hit it, it's all right. But if it's turned this way and I do that, suddenly I'm bleeding everywhere because my knives are very sharp, all right? Always make sure your blades are turned away from you. When we're gonna dice these, the way a chef is gonna do this, he's gonna come up with his knife just like this, and he's gonna make a cut into that. He's gonna cut across. He's gonna do that either once or twice, depending on the thickness of that um, onion and the size of his dice. Okay, I wanna teach you how to remove that step just so all you have to do is vertical cuts. And that is number one, quarter it after you half it, just like that, and then take these quarters and cut into him straight down, just like that. Roll him over, then do that downward cut again. Here, here. All right, now, if you look at that from the end, when it fans apart, suddenly it makes sense, okay? You can cut good dice from this at this point, and that's what I'm going to do. Look at that. And they're all the same size. That's kind of the idea of the technique being done that way. That's the reason chefs do it that way. And it allows for the pieces in the food to all be kind of uniform. That's what we're going for. It's just sort of a uniform look. To get the heat out of my jalapenos, the first thing I want to do is I want to remove that top part. Once I get the crown off of it, I take that guy and I split him lengthwise. And once I've got that split open, I can then simply take a spoon and decor it just by scraping it out of there. All right, 
there's your heat right there is the good part to eat and that's what we go with now some folks like to leave this part in and if you're one of those that's groovy you can do that it's not going to hurt a thing it's not going to injure anything but for those of you that want to remove the extra heat that's how we do it right there to process chilies when you go to cutting these things something you might want to know cutting a chili from the inside it's much easier all right and if you see how narrow i'm cutting these just very very narrow and what i'm looking for is basically to get a small small dice out of my jalapenos i want them to be kind of dispersed and not really even noticed there we go now the jalapenos i'll cut bigger dice from them because i want that scene there we go See that nice small dice? That's what we're looking for right there. Now something else I want to mention when I'm doing this kind of stuff. If you'll notice when I'm holding my vegetables, got those fingers turned under and the thumb is behind, all right? See how the fingers are turned under? Allowing me to cut this without any danger to my fingers whatsoever. All I'm doing is just kind of propping it in place so I don't hurt myself, okay? right there once I core these we'll get on with dicing with the jalapeno or the uh, poblano they're quite simple just cut off that top part grab that the inside and pull him out okay there we go you can dash out those seeds and you're ready to move on so the poblano is pretty easy to handle as far as getting the crown off when we go cutting up our poblanos, we make one big cut here. I want to do this again. If there's some extra seeds inside and those are bothering you, you can go ahead and remove them at this time. Now this one was seedier, frankly, than most poblanos that I see. So, but they're nothing like what you see here in the jalapenos, which have a much thicker, hard, uh, heavier core and the poblano doesn't. Now the poblano, we're gonna go for a much larger dice on that. So on those dice, we need something big, about a half inch square. Now, also when cutting like this, you got a bunch of little items moving around on you. Take your hand and curve it over, putting the side of your hand in the pinky right there on the board itself. And then they kind of keep things from moving that direction, all right? The finger's still curved under so nothing gets cut, and then the thumb behind or over to the side controlling movement on what you're cutting, okay? Nice, substantial dice on those. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and finish cutting all this up. Then we're going to move into tomato, garlic, and we're going to be finished with this. It doesn't take long when you really get on it. I've taken care of dicing up all of that stuff. Now I'm just pulling these tomatoes off of the vine here. And by the way, you need to know something. These are not, not vine ripened tomatoes. And if you're wondering why I'm saying that, well, it's very simple. A vine ripened tomato is a tomato that turned red and ripe like these are while it was still attached to the plant and the plant was actually growing in the ground that's when a farmer says or a tomato grower says vine ripened that's actually what they're speaking about is the fact that it turned red while the vine was still growing okay not after it had been cut off of a plant there's a different thing and they, they use that terminology in order to sell more tomatoes of course uh, because they fool people into thinking one thing when it's something different these tomatoes i'm going to just go ahead and get them all diced up and just like so i want to make this very simple okay nothing fancy at all these are quite soft Okay, 
And since they are so soft, it might work better to cut these from the inside out. Oh, looky there. See how much easier that went? And it'll slice through that skin a lot easier that way too. I'm able to cut through that skin because my knife is sharp. And I recommend you keep yours extremely sharp so you can do the exact same thing. Otherwise you're going to struggle. You're going to end up with crushed tomatoes. You're going to have dangerous knives. A sharp knife could cut you. And that means a band-aid. A dull knife can send you to the emergency room because you're using much more force behind the knife and it could come loose and go ballistic. Anytime I've got paper on garlic, I just give it a little squeeze and twist back and forth. Not hard enough to bust that part, just hard enough to hear that crackling you heard and you saw how easy that paper comes off. Isn't that too cool? All right, um, don't ever make this part of the job hard. And by the way, the neat part of this over crushing the garlic and then pulling the paper off, um, I don't get any garlic smell on my hands. And of course right now I have gloves on, but I had just no gloves. I have no smell of garlic on me because, and here's the thing, I have not broken the meat on that clove. It's still whole. I've just removed the paper. Now, when I'm going to be working on garlic, and in this case, I'm going to be mincing this stuff, first thing I do is the little scab end right there. I kind of just like to get that out of my way. I don't really appreciate seeing that in my food, and so I don't put it in my food. Whenever I'm doing garlic and I want to mince it the way I'm going to mince this, the first thing I do is I crush it to get it under control. Crushing the garlic simple enough, but when you do this, you need to remember the edge of that knife is sharp, so keep the edge of the knife pointed down. Now, if I have too much angle on my blade like this, and when I do this, the garlic will simply shoot out the other side at high speed. So take your blade, turn it slightly down, put your hand on top of it, and just push down firmly, just like so. Don't do anything more than that, all right? All right, the idea, this gets the garlic under control. If it's not like this, then when I go to cutting, it just kind of bobs all over the place and it's hard to work with. This gets it in such a way that I can chop it, mince it, and treat it however I want. Now the technique I'm gonna show you right now involves pulling back. You can still choke up on the knife and do it this way, okay? Simple rocking motion will take you through that garlic and you can mince it up just fine. The other way you can do this, and this is one that was taught to me when I was a boy, this technique involves coming back on the handle just a little bit and putting your hands, your fingers, right up here on the back of the knife, on that part right there. Now my thumb gets turned under, stays turned under, and that way this hand does a couple of things. Number one, it puts downward pressure to kind of control the knife. It also controls the knife this way, as well as moving it side to side or this motion. And you'll see what I mean here in a moment. And see how I knew, uh, used just a very simple rocking motion to break it down. It doesn't take a whole lot. But in a minute, when I want to get a fine mince, we're going to speed that up. But you can see how just this technique alone would get you there. And it's a fairly safe technique. All right, let me clear that off my blade. Now I want to get this down kind of flat. I want to speed this up just a little bit. And instead of making just a, a single motion like this, we're going to make a rocking motion like this. So now I'm making two cuts for each motion. The down cut and the up cut. Now nice way to mince, but when you're doing that, 
as you learn to do it. Now don't be in a rush to do this, but as you get good and comfortable, naturally over time will come a little more speed and you'll just get where you're a little bit faster. Now what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing some of my, my uh, garlic, pulling it over and cutting it up just like this and then going in for a little more, going in for a little more, going in for more. See how I just work my way through it? The other little technique I want to mention, when I'm mincing garlic like this, something that seems to help the cut, I do not know why. I haven't figured that part of it out yet. Something that helps the cut is if I angle my blade slightly. So I'm, I'm trying to keep the knife good and straight like this. But if I angle the blade, let me over, uh, over exaggerate this. If I angle the blade at an angle, not that much of one, but just a slight angle like so, for some reason it seems to mince a little bit better. I get a smoother cut for some reason. There we have it. We have some minced up garlic ready to go down in our dish. And it didn't take that long. Folks, learning to do that with a knife, it's just a good skill to have right there. In order to start my dish, I need to get butter right down in there. The butter important ingredient, we're going to be making a roux. Now when you're making a roux, you'll see two basic kinds of roux being made. One is a real thick pasty roux where you use more flour than you do butter. And then the other is kind of a, a soupy or a loose roux. And that's where the, there's plenty of fat and less flour and it foams up and, and cooks a little bit better. I like the second method and sometimes when there's not enough oil or butter in there I'll add a little extra oil just to make the roux a little bit easier to work with. When you do it this way you don't have to do that slow stirring where you slowly stir in liquid make a paste you know and then stir a little more in and on and on. This method goes much faster when it comes to one, making the roux, and number two, making the sauce from the roux. This is a simple white sauce. Heavy cream and a roux makes a white sauce. When you add cheese to cream, you're basically making an Alfredo. This is not the right way to make an Alfredo sauce, by the way. There's, that's a different recipe. I have that recipe on my channel, but this isn't it. This is a neat way of making a uh, white sauce that's got a good cheese flavor to it. And that's what I'm focusing on. We'll melt the butter. As soon as it's melted, we're going to get on with um, getting the flour in there and cooking it up, cooking it the right way. Now, I've got my butter melted. Let's get our flour in here. Take a whisk. Just whisk that in. Now, as I mentioned, your roux is going to be somewhat on the thin side. This is desirable, all right? This is a good thing, and it makes it easy to cook up a roux. What happens here is it's gonna foam up, and it's gonna cook that flour. And as the flour gets cooked and changes in color, it's going to turn the color of light tan, or as I like to tell people, the color of a peanut, like a roasted peanut out of the shell. That's the color we're going for. And when we get that, we then add in all of the cream all at once and this gets just better and better. Now I've got this cooking over a medium low heat. Let's take a look at it. Now it's changing in color just slightly, not a whole lot. And that's how you check your color. You just whisk it a little and it knocks out on that foam so you can see the color. Give it a few more minutes. Not quite there yet. I'll let it keep cooking a few more minutes. See how it foams up and just kind of bubbles and gets at it? That's kind of a real cool effect. Let's take another look at this. All right, see that tint, that color change there? 
that looks nice and tan, that's what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to take my heavy cream and just whisk it on in, all of it, all at once. Okay, now I'm going to bring my temperature up just a little bit to a medium temperature. I'm going to bring this up as soon as it starts to steam just a little bit and that's going to be getting around 140, 150 degrees. That's when I can start adding in my cheese and melt that in. Now you want to watch and not get this too hot otherwise you're going to end up making cheese rather than adding cheese. Okay, so we're not looking to curdle the cream, we're just looking to get it hot enough to melt our cheese, okay? So watch that closely and when it's there we're going to get on with making yummy cheese. Okay, get that off of there. It's too warm. Go ahead and get my cheese in there. So with the residual heat of just that sauce, all I have to do just keep stirring as you can see that cheese is all getting worked in this is getting nice and thick also as it has come up in temperature that flour the roux that we used thickened it right up so that adding the cheese everything happened all at once right then I got my sauce made look at that isn't that beautiful? The thickness of the sauce, it is excellent. The cheese has melted into it nicely now. Yeah. So one last thing I need to do, and I'm gonna add in some of that broth that I had from my chicken. Can you imagine what this must taste like right now? Oh, there we go. It's thinning it back down. And that's not going to be a problem because in a little bit when we put this together as our dish, well, the chicken's going to absorb a little of the moisture and some more of it's going to cook out in the oven. So, not a big issue. There we have it. We have a beautiful sauce that has flavor exploding from it and all we have to do now is set it aside. I want to cover that, set it aside, and we're going to start cooking up those vegetables. Get that on my way. Now let's move on to some other goodies. Okay let's get on with cooking up our veggies. Now I've gone ahead and got this pan or this pot rather preheated over a medium-high heat. There we are. That's the sound I want to hear. There we go. Just get all that tossed so all of it gets coated well with oil. Cooks up real nice and pretty. Alright. You need to add a little extra oil, go right ahead. Not gonna hurt a thing, not on this dish. All I'm trying to do here is get a little cooking action on this, develop some flavor. In other words, through high heat, or what they call the uh, addition of pyrolysis, through high heat we are going to try to create a condition of extra flavor, and that is just caramelizing the edges, makes the onions sweet, and makes those chilies a little bit sweet too. This is a good process that really lends a lot to a casserole dish. This is called stacking flavors. There we go. There we go. See we're getting a little bit of browning on these onions and the edges of those chilies. So I'll just keep keep on keeping on. Uh, this is going to be another seven minutes maybe, five to seven minutes, and then I'm going to go in with the other ingredients here. Look at this. See how we get the brown going on on the edges there? That's what I'm looking for right there. That's the money maker. All right. Go 
in with tomatoes. Some garlic. Folks, I'm gonna go ahead and get my spices in right now. And this is just a really good time to do this. And the reason being, we want our spices to kind of to kind of get cooked in there a little bit to allow that to get cooked into the whole dish as it were. Now on the sage, I need about one teaspoon of sage right there. I need one tablespoon, a lumpy, one tablespoon of paprika right there. Now we got color, beautiful color going on on this. I'm gonna give it a few more minutes of cook time. And at this point, it's simply a matter of allowing things to cook. The, the spices need to cook. The tomatoes need to get hot and cook for just a little bit. And for all of those flavors to kind of marry together. This is a good time to cover that pot and lower that heat down to about a medium to medium low that way it doesn't burn on the bottom make sure you stir that every three to four minutes all right see there it's been cooking for about oh seven or eight minutes now and look at what we've already got the tomatoes have gotten nice and tender and that is absolutely beautiful so we're kind of where we need to be you got all that release going on and everything is getting soft translucent looking uh, onions so now i'm going to make this happen what I need to do first is get some of my chicken in here. There we go. Some of, right? <laughs> okay. And now, my cream sauce. So now we have all of this explosive color going on with our chicken. An absolute winner in my book right there all right so i don't think this needs any more working i have this dish here i have just placed a little bit of oil in the bottom of this dish and now i'm going to take that and just kind of rub it up mostly up on the sides that's what really seems to matter and that just keeps anything from accidentally sticking you know like if you had one of those tortillas against the side it doesn't end up being stuck to it now we're ready to get this thing built. I need to start layering it and I'm going to layer it very simply. It's going to be some of this sauce to begin with on the bottom and then we're going to put in a layer of tortillas and then more sauce, then cheese, tortilla sauce, cheese, so forth. And ending with cheese when we're finished. We can do two layers of tortillas or three. Um, and it just depends on how our materials work out for us. Now folks, when I'm beginning this, I'm gonna start my oven to preheat. I just now turned it on to 350 degrees. That way as I'm working on this, it's doing the heat job. All right, now I don't need a whole lot of the uh, meat and, and chunks and things on the bottom here. Looking more for just the sauce. Um, of course, I'm gonna get some of the other, but this can be a very thin layer down here. There we go. And the whole idea here is just to give some moisture to cook into the bottom um, tortillas. If you don't do that, they get kind of dry and crusty and it's not, I guess for some folks if they like that, that's okay, but not quite my thing. And by the way, if this starts looking, sorry about that, if this starts looking like it's a little dry or anything, it's very simple. Let me show you how we handle this situation. I can just add in a little bit of that chicken stock. It's not gonna hurt a thing, all right? Just get that mixed in. And what that's gonna do is actually to give me just a little extra liquid. And it'll be good for these. So it's not gonna hurt a thing if you have to add a little extra. So here we go. And there. And now we 
we're going to do in just a moment here. No, let us layer of cheese that needs to go in. I almost forgot my own layering technique. <laughs> what a mess that would have been. Now, I don't want to go overboard on these layers of cheese. I can, but I want plenty to top it with. So I am going to kind of be a little bit conservative and then go on with that next layer. And just build it up the same way if you would, okay? I'm just getting my last layers up in there. It's a lot of food, ladies and gentlemen. And a lot of chicken. <laughs> All right. Now, more cheese over the top. And I don't think that, you know, there's such a thing as too much cheese on anything. But then I'm just one of those who really has a, an affinity for cheese, okay? I do have my oven preheated to 350 degrees. This is a dish that's pretty doggone full, all right, and I can just see it bubbling over on the edges. So what I'm going to do is take a pan and put it on the lower oven rack, and this one's going to be on the middle oven rack, and that way if anything drips out, i got something to catch it, and I don't end up with burns in the bottom of my oven, okay? There you go. There we are. 350 degrees and how long well it's not going to take long we just need it to cook or heat up throughout because everything's already cooked and then once the cheese is melted and browned on top it's ready to enjoy the ingredients quantities that we have here that was one medium chicken boiled up and shredded up right there i have one cup of the broth left over from the chicken and we use two cups of heavy cream, two and a half ounces of Parmesan. Now make sure that Parmesan is a shredded Parmesan like this because the dry stuff that, that's crumbly will not work in this recipe. You got about 15 ounces of tomatoes. You're going to be, have those diced. We got four cloves of garlic we're using, three jalapenos, one medium onion, two poblano peppers, on the roux, we used four tablespoons of butter, three tablespoons of flour. The cheese, that was one pound of extra sharp cheddar. On your corn tortillas, you're gonna be using anywhere from 15 to 20 of those to build this. You've got one tablespoon of paprika, one teaspoon of sage, one tablespoon of black pepper, and two teaspoons of salt. All of that together makes one yummy dish. Now let's take a look at this gorgeous dish. Well, let's just hope it comes out of the pan okay. If so, everything should be a go. There we are. <laughs> My timer telling me it's time to do this right here. <laughs> mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> this is really good. I'm going to be enjoying plenty of it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching this. Please enjoy your casserole. It's a very good tasting casserole. If you would, please take a look at Texas Cooking Today. There are so many recipes there. It's just exploding at the seams. If you would also take a look in the description box down below, you're going to see some links down there. Well, to Texas Cooking Today, to Chef Trotter's Tips, and to my website, which is satrotter.com which is my company, S.A. Trotter Arts. And, well, Texas Cooking Today is a project of S.A. Trotter Arts. So, if you would, please take a look at all things. Thank you very much for visiting, and please check out my next video that come out every Thursday. 
This one's a good one. You're going to love it. Heck yeah. 